my guest tonight is a maverick in every sense of the word. Since jotting down the terms to buy the Cowboys in the back of a cocktail napkin, Gerald Wayne Jones has been making headlines, most famously borrowing $150 million and parlaying that into a $3 billion NFL empire. But before his rise to fame, did you know this? He grew up helping his father promote acts in their family grocery store, was a captain for the 1964 national champion Arkansas Razorbacks, and was close to buying a pro football team at the ridiculously young age of 23. Tonight, we'll learn about what makes this undeniable icon who he is. A man who once said, there are five keys to being a good salesman, ask for the money, and I've forgotten the other four. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the owner, the president, the general manager of the Dallas Cowboys, Jerry Jones. All right, sir. Good to be with you tonight. Thank you. Good to be with you guys. Good to see you. Uh, hey, right here. Right out of the gate, standing ovation. That's a good start. Did you guys Let know, you. by the way, that he is from Los Angeles? Somebody exactly. said a really loud what right over there. <laughs> You're, you were born in L.A. I've got more cousins, first, second, and third cousins that are running around Los Angeles than you can count. And uh, when we have a family reunion, they say, but what's wrong with this picture? You don't sound like you from L.A. <laughs> and I said, well, I spent a little time over in Texas and Arkansas right. and Oklahoma on the way here. But, uh, yeah, uh, my parents uh, were in the World War II. And uh, during the years of World War II, you had many Americans that were looking for the work, the jobs that the war effort brought on. And so they came to Los Angeles to work in the aircraft plants. Well, of course, we had all of our great soldiers, that, uh, our American soldiers. And during the holidays, when they would come in on the ships, all of their relatives, our relatives our, of our heritage, would send them poinsettias. And the poinsettias had to be grown, and they were grown right here in this particular area. When my dad saw that, then he went to the greenhouses here and said, I'd like to raise and, uh, all of the poinsettias. And in those years, he made enough money, several thousands of dollars and you could buy and build a house for $400 right here. And uh, so I was born here and had the early years of my life here, and then uh, they made enough money to go back to uh, that part of the country and start the life that I grew up in. That's really where this whole story begins. And, and, it, and it is fascinating that when you dig into your history, you see how your father shaped exactly what you are today. Your dad, Pat, owns a grocery store. And in something that I could see you doing, has song acts, singers come in and perform in the grocery store to get people to come in and buy the products that your dad's selling. I mean, that is, it's such a forward way of thinking and something that obviously filtered into your life at a young age. Joe, uh, when you work, as we all do, many of us have our eye on another ball, if you will. We have our eye on the future, or we have our eye on certainly doing something different than we're doing at that particular time. Were you close with your dad? Was he a tough love guy? What, what kind of a father was, was your dad, Pat? Well, he was uh, uh, very articulate. Uh, my mother and dad, if you will, were entrepreneurs in that they probably had to borrow most everything that they used to grow those poinsettias or do what they were doing at the time. And, uh, but they were good articulators and would talk around that kitchen table. And that's where I got my education, is from around the, the kitchen table. Uh, my parents were always into work ethic. Uh, my parents told me very early, Jerry, I don't care how much you love sports, I don't care how late you practice, no matter what team you're playing for, I want you to come home and work two hours a night uh, in the store. You need to do that, either stocking or in a check or behind the check and stand, or you need to do it making ice cream to fill the uh, fill the cartons full of the ice cream, or just do the work. I enjoyed doing it. I never minded doing it. I sang, so to speak, as I worked along, so that when the time came and you were asked to do some pretty hard things. 
then it wasn't hard because you could look toward your dream. And in my case, it was being involved in sports and being involved in professional sports. Your daughter, Charlotte, said, she said, ask him what his dad did when he caught him smoking. <laughs> did, the same, did the same thing drinking. He uh, had a nice little orderly uh, uh, settee with my sister and mother and dad, uh, my mother and him. And he said, uh, Jerry, we're through eating. Ha let's have a smoke. I said, I, no, I don't want to have a smoke. He said, no, if you're going to be sitting up in the attic smoking or out in the backyard smoking and burn something down, why don't we just do it right here at the kitchen table? Sit here and have a smoke. I reached up, little old mouth, about 10 years old. I gave it that number right there, and he said, son, I said, that's not smoking. <laughs> I said, reach up there and suck that thing in there real good. That's what you want to do. Well, you know what was coming next. I took about three sucks for it. And uh, frankly, uh, what's that, 50, uh, 60 years ago, and I hadn't had four sucks since. I'll tell you <laughs> right now. And I don't know if, if the average fan realizes that Jerry Jones was a captain on a national championship football team at Arkansas. Uh, there's a picture. And by the way, were you not an offensive lineman? Well, actually, Joe, we played uh, both ways. Uh, during those years. So you years, blocked for we yourself? Played, we played both. <laughs> we played both. And yes, I did block for myself, or I blocked for someone. Yeah, that's working that on hard. The next play was going to block for me. Wow. But uh, you really did play both ways. And uh, really, it's according to uh, uh, what time of the year they took that picture. A lot of times you could start off, in that particular case, carrying the ball. And by the time attrition and injury took hold and you got in the middle of the <laughs> season, then you might be sitting up there blocking for somebody else with the ball. The big thing is, put me in, coach. I'm hot. Right. <laughs> that is, get out there and work hard and get a spot. There's a lot to talk about with regard to, to Arkansas, but maybe the most important thing is you meeting Jean, your wife. Now, I know you're a salesman. Look at that beautiful woman. What, what kind of act did you have to put together and sail to make that woman go out with that guy? Well, Gene in uh, Arkansas, uh, which is where that picture was taken at a University of Arkansas football game, and uh, Gene was one of our Miss Arkansas. And I was particularly attracted to her from the first time that I saw her. We were uh, in our freshman year there. And we had a uh, time when they took all the freshman uh, boys that were on football scholarship or on basketball scholarship, and they got to go out for a night at the fair, the country fair in school. You got to go out with someone you hadn't met before, and it was a get acquainted time. Uh, all of our group were the athletes, and all of them could really throw, or they could shoot a basketball, or they could do something good. Uh, we took uh, the freshman girls out. Jean was my date at that time. Well, as luck would have it, I couldn't knock over a bottle. I couldn't sink a basket. I couldn't take a softball and hit the side of the tent that was holding the whole thing up. <laughs> I was having an off night. Well, all of my friends, of course, for those pretty girls they were with, man, they were winning them these teddy bears. And I'd look over there, and I saw that look on Jean's face, and it was kind of pouting. And I thought, man, we've got to, I've got to either warm up or get hot or go home. I've got to get something going. <laughs> well, finally, I said, guys, y'all going to have to excuse me a minute. I'm going to go over here and maybe try something else out. Well, I went around behind that thing and found me a good guy, found me a nice-sized teddy bear, and I bought the teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then I turned around and came back up. I made sure that she and everybody else saw it, gave them a big wave, and I said, uh, I got on a hot streak with my free throws, baby. Let's go. I got the bear. <laughs> <laughs> and you eventually get the girl. Now, when you, is, there is there any truth to the rumor that when you were a senior, you're a part of this great national championship team, uh, you were selling tickets? You were selling tickets in your uniform? Yes, exactly. At every step of the way, uh, I wanted uh, I wanted more. Uh, I would have been a coach. I love football so much, and I love sports so much. But uh, I, I uh, saw what coaches made, and I wanted to do better than that, than what coaches made. Now, had I known what I was going to be paying them now, I'd have been a damn coach. <laughs> have on the but I really wanted to be, I said, they don't make enough for me. 
But what I did do is during those years, there were things that you could do as a student. And so that I sold shoes, sold them out of catalogs to the, uh, to the fraternities and to the men that went to school, to the boys. And then I basically sold insurance to the uh, uh, people that lived in what is known as Fayetteville, Arkansas now and the Bentonville, Northern Arkansas area. And I sold that insurance. And then on game day, uh, I would sell tickets. We had a great team and our tickets would go for $7 a ticket. But because we were playing so well, guess what? You could sell them for 20. <laughs> it's called scalping some places. In some places, that's okay to do that. Right. It was okay to do that at that particular time. I, the statute of limitations has run out. You're I okay. think we're safe. You're safe, so. yeah. But I was able to, during that particular time, we had a great team and I could sell those tickets up a storm. I would go in and get all my tape, get ready to tape my ankles. I would go in and you put your tape on everything you needed inside your pads. And then I'd put on my street clothes and I would go out to the gate and we had a player's gate that would let people that were associated with the player's relatives come through the gate. And those were the people that I'd sold the tickets to. And so about 20 of them, I'd walk across the end zone, look like the Pied Piper. I had my street clothes on, but I was all ready to go underneath. I'd give them their seat in the stands, then I'd come back, get in, put the rest of my pads on, go over and sit down, and our coach would say, okay, Jones is in, let's go. We're ready to go. Uh, that that is just incredible. But that would be before the ball game. So during those years, actually, because uh, uh, frankly, I've had aspirations of, of doing something, but I really didn't have uh, uh, investment at that particular time. I was going to school. But because I didn't have investment, then I did have a lot of money at that time. And a lot of my friends and a lot of people thought, well, there just must be a lot of money there. Well, the facts are that I was making that money selling shoes and selling insurance and selling those tickets uh, during that particular time. But again, Joe, it taught me how to keep your eye on the ball, playing football, and told me at the same time how to get in here and figure out a way to make ends meet, make it go. We were married. We had my son, Stephen, uh, during those years when I was in school. But uh, we hit the ground running. I guess it was uh, meant that I would be involved in sports and business at the same time because that's how I did it when I went to college. And people have dissected the fact that there you were on the same team as Jimmy Johnson. Is it fair to say that when you guys were at Arkansas, you were teammates, but you weren't best friends. I know you were roommates on the road, but that's because Jones and Johnson were close alphabetically. Well, we played on the same football team. We both uh, were lucky to be a part of the football. The football team could have won a national championship possibly without us, okay? <laughs> okay. But, uh, and we were uh, sophomores, juniors, and rookies on that team. Now, the facts are that during all but uh, two of those, or one of those years, my best friend was my wife as far as who I spent my time with because uh, Jimmy and I were on the team together, but I was married and went home. I mentioned to the crowd before we started here tonight that not long after you win a national championship, you're with a group of people, you're trying to put money together to put together a pizza chain, and the San Diego Chargers of the AFL come up for sale. You're 23 and hoping and close to buying an AFL franchise. I mean, that that's mind-blowing to well, the it, average person. It doesn't fit when you think about it, uh, but it does, it does fit if you can dream about it. And um, I basically had uh, really sold myself. I had uh, worked hard to get uh, this group to finance me, to help me build these pizza parlors. And I was uh, still in school at the time. And uh, so I got them to help me build those parlors. And I said, uh, if uh, someday I'm gonna maybe come to you and ask you to loan me money, at the end I was making $1,000 a month draw against my sales. That was my salary at the time. And I said, someday I may come to you and talk to you about uh, a ball team. And that someday came up right as I was talking to this particular group during that same period of time. And uh, so uh, I presented them the uh, uh, San Diego Chargers. I visited with many of the founders of the AFL. I'll never forget visiting with Mr. Lamar Hunt 
when I was like 22 years old, and Mr. Hunt said, boy, Jerry, you're so young to be sitting here, and you must have done well. Well, I said, well, truly, Mr. Hunt, I haven't done you can imagine. You can you can actually can you can actually it. say jack shit right exactly. now if you want to. Okay. I haven't but, done jack shit. But the point is, I hadn't, <laughs> and I knew he knew that I hadn't because they'd done a real good check on uh, who I was. Uh, but uh, Mr. Hunt and uh, uh, at the time Mr. Baron Hilton, Baron Hilton said, uh, uh, "You uh, have them put a million dollar letter of credit on my desk in Chicago, and we'll talk business." and we'll see if you're serious. Otherwise, I don't have time to mess with a tire kicker, so to speak, somebody that's just looking interested. Well, uh, before the sun set the next day, as a matter of fact, bright and early the next morning, they had that million dollar letter of credit there, and the next thing I knew, uh, my father was reading where I had an interest in buying the San Diego Chargers, and I'm telling you, he couldn't believe his ears, and when he got on the phone, he said, what is my millionaire son doing today? <laughs> by the way, is he too busy to talk to his old dad? Well, how much? How much? Would you the... get your ass back home here and tell me what you're doing? That was my dad. How, how, to how much of the million was yours? Well, none of it was mine. Okay. Because I was born. I just feel I like it's important to establish well, that. Well, right? no, thank you, Joe. And I'm going pretty fast here, but the facts are, uh, my father basically said, Jerry. He said, uh, this does not work. You don't have enough money to pay your bills, and you're going to start off underwater. I said, Dad, but it won't uh, remain that way. I'll figure something out. And he said, well, right there is where we've got a parting of the ways. I said, you know, Dad, uh, uh, this is me. Uh, you're not involved here. You're not going to sign a note. You're not having to assure anybody I'm going to be paid. He looked over at me with tears in his eyes. I hope I don't tear up. But he looked over at me. He said, I'm Jerry, he said, I don't want you to ever tell me that I don't have something invested in you. He said, you're a young man and you've never stumped your toe, you've never failed. And you're talking about going in something that might do that for you. And he said, uh, that's my blood that's going down if you go down. And he said, if you can't pay somebody, there's a good chance they may come calling on old dad to pay. So don't tell me I don't have something invested here. Well, I did listen to it and uh, turned that down at that time. And, and what so, a blessing. And uh, as it turns out, uh, I'm sitting here with the Dallas Cowboys rather than the San Diego Chargers. But, but still at the time. Yeah. But here, here's, the, here's, the next, here's the next chapter, and it's jumping ahead a little bit. But my gosh, when you bought the Dallas Cowboys in 1989 for $151 million, which was the most that anybody had ever paid for a franchise, there you were really again. Y you were faced with those same odds, it's just that the stakes were even higher. I mean, you, you became the risk taker that maybe your dad wasn't. You're a bigger risk taker than he was, and it's paid off to a $3 billion situation with the Dallas Cowboys. Well, the, the thing that had happened along the way was uh, uh, approximately 20, 25 years had gone by during that time. And I had uh, had uh, very good fortune, and I was principally in oil and gas, and again, taking risks, and uh, had been able to accumulate enough money to lose that kind of money. In other words, I had it to lose. And uh, uh, which not only is a big difference, it was a big difference on the dynamic of uh, ultimately getting it done. I bought 13% of the Dallas Cowboys from the federal government, the FDIC, because they had been foreclosed on and you had to buy them from the government to own them. It was a downtime economically. But it was the only time to have that opportunity in my mind. Obviously, I had dreamed from the time that I was a junior in college or from the time that I was out there selling those football tickets. Uh, I had uh, uh, dreamed when I was sitting there uh, talking to that guy about buying that pair of shoes as a fraternity brother. I had dreamed about someday getting to be a part of sports and someday getting to be a part, if you will, of uh, the NFL. So I had dreamed that. Your daughter Charlotte told me, though, at the time, she can remember you at the family dinner table with your hand shaking so bad with the stress you were under that she could hear the ice cubes in your glass clinking because that's how scared you were of having to go back home and say, 
I, I swung for the fences and, and I missed. Well, you couldn't do it. You just couldn't uh, uh, go back home. And uh, you've heard of the uh, great story of the commander that burned the ships. And when the troops tried to go back, there was no ships to go back to. Uh, literally, there was some of that in buying the Dallas Cowboys. On the other hand, I was living a dream. I got to live a dream. Uh, you got a chance to, uh, boy, Joe, I didn't realize I was going to get emotional here, but you got a chance to get up every day and get to uh, live that dream and not only do it, but live it in a way that uh, hadn't been done before. Gosh, we were excited about the Cowboys. We were excited about the NFL. We were excited that there was such a thing as a sponsorship. I really thought that when I bought the team and it was losing a million dollars a month, I really had thought that I would go buy another business and figure out how to meld that business with the team. It might be like Budweiser and the St. Louis Cardinals. But what I did find out is that you could basically go in and show an entity or show a service or show a product and you could basically invite them to be a part of the team, to be the product that the team got up and talked about if and when you were interested in the Dallas Cowboys. And that was a sponsorship. And that hadn't been done before, but I found out you could do that without going to buy Budweiser. So there we started down the road of sponsorships and of course was a very meaningful part of the success that we've had. Well, one of the hardest things you had to do was right out of the gate, you had to make a coaching change. And you fired Tom Landry. I, for somebody who is a football person, that had to be a hard thing to do. Well, uh, keep in mind for uh, those that uh, may have just heard this, Coach Landry was the only coach the Cowboys had ever had. So that without uh, really giving it uh, that much thought, you really were dealing with an iconic name and an iconic individual. Now, I respected Coach Landry. I respected it enough that to uh, be one of the main reasons that I was there to buy because to make that kind of commitment, I had to respect it. But I didn't understand. Uh, I didn't understand the kind of criticism you were going to get for making that change after 29 years of being uh, with uh, the same coach. And uh, certainly I had a backlash from it. Uh, but know. to be fair, he, he was approaching his mid-60s. He was an unbelievable coach, Super Bowl champion two times over. Uh, but the franchise was on a decline, so much so that there you were with an opportunity to buy it. This team was, without a doubt, uh, one of the most visible teams in all of sport. But I wanted to have taken this team this way, a new way, a different way, a way that started down and out and turn it around not only on the football field but off the football field and do some things that impacted the franchise in that way, as proud as I was of what Coach Landry had done. And that spurred me on and really helped ease through those days. The guy you bring in uh, is Jimmy Johnson. Is it fair to say that when you guys were at Arkansas, you saw something in Jimmy whether he was your best friend or just teammate or acquaintance that told you that he'd be a great head coach. I did want him to be the coach of the Dallas Cowboys, but I wanted him to be because I was fixing to empty my bucket. I was fixing to give any and everything that I'd ever stood for, for what that's worth. And I wanted to empty the bucket. I told him and we talked about the story of what if we went down to Dallas? And what if we went down there and things turned around and we were a part of a team that was turning around at the same time the economy, because Dallas was on its ass. I'm telling you, it was down and out. And so what if all of a sudden the economy started coming back? People started getting jobs, people perked up, and all of a sudden good things started to happen. We could be identified with that kind of success. And we both believed that story, and we, uh, uh, that was all there was to it. There was no other agenda. There was nothing else to uh, be involved. Uh, there was no him or me. It was about how were we going to get the job done. Uh, to make another point, we won only one football game our first year. Out of 16, we won one football game. 
That's how well we played. That's how well we were coached. That's how many games we won. And we had uh, my great friend and great player, Troy Aikman, as our quarterback. We won one football game. I had these, this writer come up to me about six games through the season. And uh, he said, these have got to be the, the worst days of your life. You have got to be under such stress. Uh, this is a rough time. And I looked over at him, and I knew he was genuine, and uh, one of the few I had met early that I thought was genuine, but I said, you look like you're asking a genuine question. I'm going to give you a genuine answer. I said, these are not only the, not the roughest days of my life. They're not the roughest days of my life in Dallas, Texas. I said, about 10 years ago, I flew into Dallas, Texas, walked up to the counter to rent a car, handed my credit card over, which would have made me about 34 years old. I handed that credit card over there. The lady looked down that list, saw my name on the list, reached up, cut my card right in two, and said, young man, you need to learn how you pay your bills. I said to the writer, that's a hard day in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> Not what I'm experiencing here right now. What's happened behind the scenes? I work at Fox. I, I do the games with a guy named Troy Aikman at Fox. And what you may not know is what Jerry, when he got into the club as the owners, uh, talking about the owners club, you ended up saying with regard to the television deal, let's let Fox get in the door. Let's at least hear what they have to say instead of let's just go with where we've always been. Let's open this up and see what kind of money we can make. And, and the rest is, is literally history. Well, Joe, uh, the uh, number one thing that an NFL team depended on was their television income. And uh, these were lean times for the NFL relative to any time since or really before. And uh, the networks had asked the NFL teams to reduce the amount of dollars that they were paying them to show the games. That's much different now. And, uh, but they asked to re reduce it. And uh, there were very few owners that were willing to uh, not reduce it. They felt like they needed to know so that they knew where the dollar was going to be so that they could pay the players and uh, provide the stadiums and do everything to go with it. Uh, uh, I, I didn't want to. Uh, the commitment that I'd made to buy the Cowboys, uh, I was not for reducing the amount of the television at the time. Fox had made an offer, the prior offering, and Mr. Murdoch basically said, you know, I'll be a player here. I'll come in this time, this round of bidding, but I do not want to be a stalking horse. I'm not going to be one that you just put me out there, get the price up, when in fact you're going to go with CBS. So I personally assured him, and of course uh, he did step in and make the offer, and the two CBS and NFL, who were absolutely tied at the hip in perception and visibility, no longer were there. CBS no longer did the game. This was a traumatic time, but it was also a very controversial time. And I had a lot of owners at that time, friends, or later to be friends of mine, I didn't know them well enough, shake those fingers in my eyes and shake them up and said, you're nothing but a wildcatter. You can sit here and take these kind of risks. We, we don't want to do that. We can't do that. You're screwing this thing up, Jones. Did any of these blue blood owners eventually come around and say thanks? Yes, and to the man, really did, and say uh, thank you. Uh, so at the time, uh, we, uh, uh, you'd just come in. Uh, uh, we, uh, we were mad at you, but we're not mad at you anymore because the swing from that year of that year not taking a new deal to getting another deal was a quarter of a billion dollars, the difference in the price in one year's time. So it was a huge, significant change, but, uh, sea change for the NFL. But this is what you learn from the whole oil and gas business part of your life. You're willing to take a risk. There's a concept called tolerance for ambiguity. I love it. I've always loved the name. Tolerance for ambiguity. Some people do not function at all if they don't know for sure they're going to get their check on Friday and it's Monday. They have to have it. They are not good. They are not good singers. They are not good. Uh, whatever their skills are, they aren't good. 
Some people are brilliant when they don't know what their check is going to be. That's the Mississippi Riverboat Gambler. They're at their very best. They're glib, they're charming, they're entertainment, and they tear their ass up. And they're the ones that don't know they're going to get the check. The tolerance for ambiguity, the tolerance for unknown that will bring out that gambler or that in you uh, is not for everybody. Some are just a barn with a, they can live with some risk and live with the unknown. And, uh, but by the way, the ones that will tell you that have had a lot of days when they've been sitting there with this phone and this one and been told your little ass just hit a dry hole and that side sinking. And this side over here, you're talking, got your voice upbeat, trying to talk old Joe into going in a new deal with you at the same time. You just I'm in. Now I'm in. Just now, so you know, I'll put my money in. the trick is, don't let that voice break somewhere in between there. <laughs> and so when we can't turn back and we step up there and we know we're going to make those that we want proud of us, ashamed of us, or we know that we want to show them the ones that said we couldn't do it, then it adds a degree of passion. And that passion showed, and uh, uh, there really was no stopping it. This is where Jimmy Johnson and Jerry Jones are going to be dangerous. Together, these guys like coming to the Super Bowl. They want to continue this run. It's remarkable because in 89, you go from 1 and 15, and within four years, you've won two Super Bowls with Jimmy Johnson. And eventually, one night or one morning, all of a sudden it hits, Jimmy's not my coach, or if I'm Jimmy, I'm not coaching the Dallas Cowboys. So what? went wrong. Uh, this, is, uh, this was, and uh, 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 Bill Walsh, the great coach of the 49ers, said this is a classic case of a couple of friends who grew careless with their relationship. And I'll accept that responsibility because I was the boss. And I should have, if anybody had to give a little in terms of anything to do with a relationship, then I agree with it. Uh, uh, then I accept that very much. Uh, as you all know, uh, this is pro sport, uh, and, uh, uh, but it, it works that way. Some place down the line, somebody has to break the tie. Somebody has to say yes or no, and it ultimately has to be one. If it has two, then somebody has to come in and make that decision for you. In this particular case, it happened to be the one that risked the hundreds of millions of dollars to buy the thing, that was the one that basically made the call on how we were going to get it done. Now, you say that's too simplistic, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, if the two of us couldn't have worked that out, then uh, what happened happened. What Jimmy was, was brilliant. Still is brilliant. Uh, I think Jimmy could be a success doing anything he uh, wants to do. Uh, he chose coaching, and coaching was uh, lucky to have him. I will say this. Uh, we were able to win two Super Bowls together, and we were able to have dreams and a time that neither one of us thought that we would ever approach ever in our lives, and it had to do with football. I wouldn't trade one minute for every part of it because our families got to be involved in it, and to this day, we're still living off of a lot of the glory that was created right there. I remember I hired Barry Switzer as uh, the coach to replace Jimmy Johnson. And Barry Switzer was the coach at Oklahoma. And so Barry came in the very day that Jimmy left, when Jimmy left me and the coach. And Barry came in and he said, where in the hell is Jimmy? Where is Jimmy? I want to talk to him. I said, well, Jimmy's gone. He said, no, he can't be gone. And he said, uh, he, he, we just uh, announced this thing yesterday. He said, he's got to be back there. I said, no, he's gone. I said, what are you so anxious to, uh, what do you want to say to him? He said, I wanted to get you two knotheads up here on the couch together and look at you the way I used to look at you when I coached you over at Arkansas and ask you two, how could y'all screw this up? Winning two Super Bowls and end up sitting here split up. Now, I'm real proud to say that two years later, Barry was standing up there holding that Super Bowl high that uh, he had taken one to the house there too, and we're sure proud of that. 
I followed my dad in, into the business, and, and I think it's, it's one of the great compliments you can pay a parent. It, that wasn't my intention, but, but now being a parent myself, I realized, you know, I, I wanted to be around him. I couldn't get close enough to him when I was a kid. I wanted to do what he did. Now your kids are all with you in business. Um, and, and they are hard-working kids. I mean, and Steven certainly is, and Jerry, and Charlotte, and all the stuff she does. These kids, have, if you learn from your dad, Pat, they've learned from you. Um, it's impressive what they've done. Well, uh, I told my mother and daddy, uh, uh, they didn't realize where things had gotten for me and my family until they found out I had uh, bought the Cowboys. And uh, that's when Dad said I didn't realize. Uh, didn't realize you were there at that point. I said, well, you know, Dad, uh, we always want to talk about your stuff. And he was so proud of, of what he had done and should be. He's very accomplished. But more important than anything, what he and uh, Mother had done <clears throat> was allowed me to be that cat that had that tolerance for ambiguity. Because you can't be worried about paying for your kids' college education. You can't be worried about how they're going to get along or how your wife might get along if you lose your job. You can't do that if you're out there gambling and taking risks that could wipe you out. Something has to give. So it is quite a blessing to have the security, just the mental security of a family that has had success so that you know if you did extend yourself that you would at least have their shoulders to be there with you at that time. And I told my father, I said, boy, y'all <coughs> all have these cowboys just like I do. That's how we got them. We stood... Uh, we stood on our shoulders to get that done. We have certainly enjoyed the benefit of my parents and my children have enjoyed them. One of the things that I got to do, and I wouldn't take anything for it, and I know we've got a lot of parents in this room, but uh, in, in, as a young business person, I knew I was going away from home a lot and I was principally in oil and gas and again, taking risks, but I was gone a lot. But I wanted so much to be a part of their young lives, and so sometimes I would leave a meeting, let's say in Oklahoma, and I would go 300 miles and come back and do a football practice for my kids, and then never go home, go back over and get the meeting going again. But basically, I wanted to do that for those kids. Well, funny thing happened on the way. Those kids all of a sudden started getting to be bigger kids. And when they wanted somebody to go with them, they started wanting their dad and mother to go with them because that's who wanted to be with them when they were involved in their activities. I've gotten to play on a national championship team. I've gotten to be a part of the Dallas Cowboys and everything we've talked about today. So much a blessing to be a part of. Nothing. Nothing has ever meant as much as what you get to do with those kids. Those memories, those times right there, no matter what kind of gain you might have given up or what kind of gain you've given up, it was all worth it to have been able to be involved during those times. And what a crazy thing happens is, is that when you get on up and you're 50 and you're 60 and you're 70, all of a sudden, when people are saying, well, I don't know why I don't get a call from my kid. I don't know why I don't do this. All of a sudden, the parents and people that were giving it up so much back when they were 30 and 40, their kids can't go anyplace without them. They don't want to be without them. That's the order of things. Those of us who had wonderful parents, who had parents that were inordinately accomplished, that really made you proud and really showed you some direction, to have gotten that plus had that kind of input from, from your parents, we're the blessed. When I talked to her, Charlotte, she said, I've never hung up the phone with my dad where he didn't say, I love you now. 
and, and I don't mean to, to pile on, but there's something away from the business. You're leaning on these kids now. She said, you know, he'll dream up some crazy idea and it's up to us to figure out how to do it. Um, but they do figure out how to do it. Certainly the experience that I've had, it's not one thing fair about uh, in any way, any of my three children being referred to as a child or as, as some uh, got something because of what we have, uh, uh, where we are, because truly they were young adults when I bought the Cowboys. I was 45 when I bought the team. And so they were young adults and they've been in this thing from the get go and they really should and do deserve their due relative to uh, what we've been able to get done today. And by the way, I want them to have their share of the blame for not being to a damn Super Bowl. That's today. right. <laughs> right. AT&T Stadium, which it's called now, is an incredible, incredible palace that you've built. Well, Joe, uh, back to the years that uh, uh, when we were in Houston, uh, the team, college team that I played on was playing in the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas, and we had practiced in Houston to stay away from our families and stay away from all of the celebrating that usually goes on around a bowl game so that you could get some sleep and then go down there and play a bowl game, which we did the first. Well, right at that time, the Astrodome was just being completed there in Houston. And it was not only well publicized, it truly was the eighth wonder of the world. Coach Brawls had gotten them to show our team uh, the stadium. When I walked in there, it looked like you were on the moon. It was unbelievable, the stadium, and, and uh, there it was completely enclosed. But I thought then and there, gosh, what, what has uh, football come to? Well, some 30 years later, when I was sitting dreaming of what this stadium might look for that we have today. And I thought, what would it be like to be a part of building something that you could put six Astrodomes in? Now, you know, when I bought the Cowboys, it was a hard time. It was a very hard time uh, uh, economically for uh, a lot of people. I vowed I had danced with the devil, boy, in my mind. I'll never dance with him again. There'll never be anything that would entice me give me any desire to get close to those kinds of feelings I had when I thought I was going to lose it or I thought I wasn't going to be able to pay. I'm not going back there again. Lord and behold, I go out there. We start that stadium. We started uh, not 1994, actually, was when it was started. And all of a sudden, we're with 3,000 people out there. We're 50 feet in the ground. And this country has, in 207, in 208, right about that time, it has one of the greatest economic downturn that anybody living on this planet has ever seen. And right about then was when we were digging the dirt to build this massive stadium. Now, at that particular time, we had a choice. Were we going to cut back? It was well known the Dallas Cowboys were building this stadium. Or is this a time when we need to sell and spend our way out of hard times? Is this the time when we are to turn on the coal, pour the coal to it? Well, I want you to know, Joe, what we did was go. We poured on. I increased the scope of the stadium. We went the other way. We built many clubs in that area that are in what are normal concourses in other stadiums. But these clubs look like Las Vegas nightclubs that are in this stadium. And sure enough, our fans, sure enough, the people that really we wanted to build and build nice for, recognized that that's what we were doing, and they came in and supported that. You know, I'm going to say something that you're not going to like, which is that in almost 20 years now, the Dallas Cowboys have won two playoff games. Two. Absolutely. And I know that that doesn't sit well with you. But what does, and what blows me away, is that the team that networks fight over to cover the Dallas Cowboys, whether it's NBC or CBS or Fox or ESPN, you want the Cowboy game because that is the game that draws the ratings, the eyeballs. I think you're a big part of that. I think you're somebody that people want to see. They want to see what you have to say. 
I, I think you've been a big part of keeping that team relevant. Well, Joe, uh, uh, I've always believed that uh, for fans, uh, uh, different, different aspects of sports can carry a certain meaning or a certain degree of interest. And I want to be a part of any way that I can of every aspect of it. We are the first team in the NFL to ever have a camera in our draft room. Chaz? Yes, sir. Yeah, this is Jerry Jones with the Dallas Cowboys. We're all uh, high-fiving. You're a Dallas Cowboy now. We just turned your car <laughs> in. And I'm going to tell you something. Our coach and our, co and our scouts like to have shit <laughs> in the draft room when it came in there. It really did. But it's such, a, uh, it's such an entertaining thing for those that want to be involved. Now then, literally millions of people sit there uh, all day long on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and watch what goes on in that draft room at that time. So it's full of, uh, full of things that we can do that and make the game uh, embellish what goes on on the football field. But uh, it, it, uh, the, the, the number one thing that I could say tonight is that I've had a chance to spend uh, 27 years now with the Dallas Cowboys and be a part of the National Football League. Uh, whatever they're worth, whatever they're purported to be worth, they ought to double that and send me a bill for it because I've had more fun than that, haven't I? What's next for you? We've got the opportunity to join the Dallas Cowboys with the high school system of the city of Frisco, Texas. And uh, they have 50,000 high school students, and we literally are going to join them at the hip. And so that when Tony Romo is coming off the practice field, the high school quarterback for Frisco, Texas, and one of those 14 high schools will be walking on the field, either practicing or getting ready to play a game. We're mixing it up. And we're basically showing how pro sports, and certainly as it, uh, as it evolves through co collegiate, has a mix in with high school and where that all fits in together as far as the people that are guiding them, which are the mom and pops and grandmas and grandpas that are out there supporting them. We've got an opportunity to do that. And so consequently, we've uh, joined with Frisco and we have built an indoor training center that uh, will seat uh, 12,000 people for high school football games. It's uh, air conditioned, domed, and our total investment there will be over a billion and a half dollars that we're spending to have a tribute to uh, high school, amateur, professional sports, and it will involve care, wellness, uh, the, the uh, uh, developing of young players at the high school level in and as it relates to professional football. And consequently, we know, we don't have to ask, we know that you'll uh, see it and be a part of it by way of uh, television and by way of Fox or by way of ESPN because we're going to have it involved in what we're doing out there every day. So it's, it's a way also to combat the conversation and the concern about head trauma, about trying to grow this game, because obviously this is, this is something that's at the forefront of what's going on in the NFL, the long-term effect of head trauma, and the worry that parents aren't going to sign their kids up for football anymore because they're not being taught properly, whatever. You have a way now of, of teaching properly, of being involved at the grassroots, the ground level, to really help that as these young players grow. We, uh, we uh, adamantly support uh, young athletes playing football. Uh, we support it being done in an educated and in a very safe way. We obviously feel very strongly about what the record shows and numbers and about this issue of, uh, uh, of um, uh, 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 head trauma. And uh, we feel very strongly that uh, we uh, uh, have the way to show and the light to show how for uh, parents, young parents, to make those decisions. And with that, um, we're going to move to something that I think I'm going to apologize for before we do it. We've had writers that have come up with five questions. I've not seen them. It's, it's stapled together here. This is our chance to get to know Gerald Wayne Jones better 
by how you answer these questions. You feel game for this? I'm go. Let's right. go. I know. I know you're. How could that? by nature you're a real scared guy. You guys. Um, <laughs> would you rather have a higher IQ or a photographic memory? Oh, I think that memory. I'd rather remember everything. I might have wanted to be smarter when I was 21. I'd like to remember more today. All right. <laughs> would you rather be invisible or be able to read people's minds? Oh, I think. Um, uh, I've, uh, I, I know what you're thinking. I'd like to see where you go tonight. I'll just, right. I'll just be, I'll be by your side tonight. <laughs> okay, okay, good. <laughs> the invisible Jerry Jones next to me. Uh, would you rather be stranded on a deserted island alone or with someone you hate? Oh, I'd rather be with someone, much rather be with someone I hate. I, yeah. I, uh, you can make it that, work uh, That alone stuff, I couldn't stand that. We got to have someone else's fault, for sure. Okay. <laughs> you need somebody to blame exactly. when the fire goes out. Okay, Surely good. I couldn't have done this. Right. What's the last meal you cooked? Oh. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I warmed up uh, some... Uh, <laughs> some uh, wait, wait. You know, warmed up. <laughs> Well, it counts as a meal. Okay. It counts as a meal. Right. All right. You warmed up what? I warmed up some uh, clam soup this morning up at... Uh, uh, God, that sounds up awful. At, uh, Oxnard. <laughs> clam chowder at Oxnard. For breakfast? For breakfast and put a little bunch of Tabasco in it. <laughs> it helps hips get well. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Would you rather fight one... Listen to this, all right? This is going to take a minute. Would you rather fight one horse-sized duck... Or 100 duck sized horses? Hey. Let, me, let me repeat that. One horse sized duck, I mean, it's a big friggin' duck, or 100 duck sized horses? Well, what I'm gonna do is go back up. I'd rather have more of an IQ and less of a memory so I could answer that question right there. <laughs> I, wouldn't you rather uh, take on the big, the big duck instead of a hundred little things coming at you? Is that really down there? Uh, yeah. What do what? you think I? <laughs> what's your friggin' answer? One horse-sized duck. <laughs> You're not getting off the hook. Do you want a hundred little duck horses coming at you, or do you want one big duck to well. take on? I'll tell you what, Joe, the way you're going about this, I'd just soon be on the island alone. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Jones. Uh, hey, buddy. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. Hey, buddy. You want it? Did you? Good. I hope you did. Thank you, guys. All right, sir.